الحمد لله والصلاة والسلام على رسول الله وعلى آله وصحبه ومن والاه أشهد أن لا إله إلا الله وحده لا شريك له وأشهد أن محمدا عبده ورسوله So we're continuing on in the book of Ibn Rajib al-Hamdali Al-Khushu'a fi al-Salah Khushu'a in the prayer And uh, we spent last week talking about the different definitions that the companions gave as well as what he mentioned, the khushur, meaning the softness of the heart, it's being gentle, still submissive, broken, and yearning. And the Prophet ﷺ saying that there's a morsel of body, there's a piece of the body that khashat, that if it has khushur, the entire body will have khushur, and if, oh sorry, that saluhat, saluhat jisadukullu, that if it is corrected, then the entire body will be correct. Way that said that then if it becomes corrupt, then the entire body will be corrupt, and it's the heart. And the different statements with regards to how the presence of the heart is reflective in the presence of the body. And so, if a person is moving around, and there's no stillness in that person's body during the prayer, then there is no stillness in that person's heart. One of the things that I wanted to just, you know, uh, stop on. Uh, really quickly just to begin is the question of why is it that when you enter into the prayer all of a sudden you have so many different thoughts right you guys I'm sure have all experienced this that as soon as you enter into the prayer you know when you're talking on the phone to somebody you can focus on that conversation when you're uh, watching TV or watching a video you can be completely absorbed in it but when you enter into Salah it's very hard to get absorbed in the prayer. In fact, it uh, is almost the opposite. As soon as you enter into the salah, you are you remember everything outside of the prayer. Even things that were on your to-do list from four days ago that you completely forgot to do, as soon as the salah starts, you remember it, right? So why is that? Why is that? And I will actually make an extension. Does anybody experience that same thing when they're reading the Quran? Not just in salah, right? When you're reading Quran as well. So why, why do these two things, why do you think these two things are so, um, there's such distraction involved in them? You know, just yesterday I was reading the Quran and then it was like the end of the day. It was the end of the day. And I had just been busy all day and then I opened up the Mus'haf to read like half a page and then I remembered, man, I haven't called my mom all day. And I had forgotten to call her the entire day until... I started reading Quran and then all of a sudden it's like, oh man, forgot to call her. Why is that? Does anybody want to take a, or want to inform us? What's that? What's what's in a shaitan? Okay. Okay. What's what's from shaitan? Why doesn't shaitan do what's what's when you're doing anything else? You can sit in a class like this and you can focus for 45 minutes or 20 minutes at a time. 25 minutes at a time. And this is ilm, this is knowledge. Yes? Um, you mentioned it last class. Did I? Yeah, you did. Okay. Great. Well, I'm not really uh, excited at the fact that I mentioned it last class and nobody hit me back on it. Very good. So the greatest return on investment is in the salah and in the recitation of the Quran. I'm going to ask you guys next week too. This is an important concept to complete, to, to remember because... It shows you that, and that's one of the reasons, uh, inshallah, when we get to it, is why a person, when they're re- commanded to recite the Qur'an, it's to say, A'udhu Billahi Minash Shaitan Rajeeb, even when you enter into the Salah, because you're realizing that in this moment, you're just going to get attacked so severely. Okay, quickly. So, now we get to the source of Khushur. Who is our reader, inshallah? The source of Khushur. That is page 24. We ended at hypocritical humility, and now we're going to talk about the source of Khushu. You going to read for us? Sure. All right. The source of the Khushu that So start by saying the author, may Allah have mercy on him, said. Uh, where is that? It's in your head. Just say it. The author. <laughs> okay. Um. The author. The author. May Allah have mercy on him said. May Allah have mercy on him said. 
The source of the flashu that takes place in the heart is the gnosis of a load of greatness, magnificence, and perfection. The more gnosis a person has of Allah, the more flashu he has. The hearts vary in their flashu and according in accordance to the gnosis they have of the one they have humbled to, and in accordance to the hearts witnessing the attributes that lead to flashu. Some hearts are humbled by the strength of their perceiving his closeness to his servant and his seeing their innermost secrets, which leads to being shy of him most high and constantly being aware of him in every state of motion or stillness. Some hearts are humbled through their perceiving the magnificence of Allah, his greatness and his grandeur, which leads to being in awe of him and magnifying him. Some hearts are humbled through perceiving his perfection and beauty, which leads to drowning in the love of him and the desire to meet and see him. Some hearts are humbled through perceiving the enormity of his seizure, vengeance, and punishment, which leads to fearing him. He, glorious as he, is the mender of hearts that have broken for his sake. He, glorious as he, comes close to hearts that are filled with humility to him, in the same way that he comes close to one who is standing in prayer, privately discoursing with him, in the same way that he comes close to one who rubs his face in the dust when prostrating, in the same way that he draws nearer to the throngs of people visiting his house, standing in abject hu uh, humility at Arafah, drawing close and boasting about them to the angels, in the same way that he comes close to his servants when they invoke him, ask of him, and seek his forgiveness in the early hours of the morning, and he answers their supplications and grants their requests. Very good. So, Ibn, uh, Ibn Rajab is discussing uh, this concept which is called inkisar, which means to be broken in front of Allah, and the importance of making sure that you are, when you enter into this prayer, that you are Cont uh, you are thinking uh, cognizant of who is your audience in this moment. Who is whose audience are you in? And it's Allah Azza wa Jalla. And He says that some people their hearts become broken when they're reflecting on the greatness of Allah. Some people's hearts become broken out of reverence and love. Some people's hearts become broken while they're standing in front of Allah because of remembering His vengeance and His punishment. Right? And you yourself will transition through these different stages throughout the day. Fajr time, it might be love. After Dhuhr time, it may be fear. After Asr time, it may be as you're going through these different days. Just like if you've uh, met someone or you're interacting with someone, you're interacting with your parents, you're interacting with your spouse, you're interacting with your children, you're interacting with someone, and you, know, you transition in your relationship with them throughout the day. You know, you did something wrong, you're kind of feeling uh, a little bit, uh, you know, uh, a little bit uh, cautious with regards to how you're dealing with them. Maybe there's a little bit of fear there. Maybe disappointment. Uh, they, your, your mood changed. You realize something that they did or you've, you've uh, fixed the relationship. Now it's back to hope or it's back to love. And so that person is having this living, their heart is having this living, breathing connection with Allah Azza wa Jalla. And so throughout the day, they are uh, standing in front of Allah, and each time they have to remember they're standing in front of Allah again. And so it, kept, it comes to a level where that audience that they have, or that connection that they have is so strong, where the Salah itself becomes an appointment that they're remembering ahead of time. And then the Salah ends up doing what Allah Azza wa says, إِنَّ الصَّلَاةَ تَنْهَا عَنِ الْفَحْشَاءِ وَالْمُنْكَرِ that the salah itself prevents from fahsha and munkar. It prevents from indecency and it prevents a person from evil. Because that person is going to realize, oh, I'm not going to do this. Why? Because at 1 o'clock I have an appointment. With who? With Allah Azza wa I'm going to stand in front of them. Right? And I'm going to stand in front of Allah Azza wa Jal with this khushu' and with a brokenness due to his fear of, fear of him and fear of his vengeance and fear of his intiqam. And so I'm not going to do what I would have done if I didn't have that khushur in the prayer. And I didn't have that strong relationship. And so the salah in and of itself will prevent a person eventually 
that connection will become so strong that it will prevent the person from doing fahsha, indecencies, shameless activities, and munkar, and evil. And hence the Prophet ﷺ, he said about a person, maybe that person, he was a person who drank alcohol, the Prophet ﷺ said maybe that, that person's prayer will prevent them from drinking alcohol. At some point in time, the prayer itself is going to correct this person's behavior. And, and this shows us also the importance of focusing on the prayer and making sure that, you know what, this prayer is an anchor, anchor for a person's personality. If I'm wayward, if I'm not doing everything that I, that I should be doing, then at least let me make sure that my anchor is strong and that I'm praying my prayers on time. Right? And this is a great advice for, for everybody. That if I'm going to get one thing right, then let me make sure that I'm getting the prayer right and everything else, inshallah ta'ala, eventually will follow. And that's the importance of focusing on the prayer again and again. And so Allah Azawajal is the mender of hearts. And then he gives a number of beautiful examples of places in which a person's heart should be, you know, there should be this humility with Allah Azawajal. And he says, for example, Allah comes to the one who's in prayer privately discoursing with him. And so you recognize that when you're in prayer, this Isha prayer that we just prayed or uh, maybe some people will be praying in a little while, that you're, in, you're literally in private discourse with Allah Azza wa And we talked about that last week. Every sajda should have a purpose, you know? I mean, we spend our entire day, we spend 24 hours, we spend 40 hours a week trying to get stuff. We're trying to secure benefits for ourselves, and we're trying to remove harm from ourselves. We're trying to work why so that we can not get evicted and so that we can get money so that we can do things that we need to manipulate so many different people in our spheres of influence we need to manipulate our parents and our spouse and our children and our professors and our friends and we have so many people that we interact with on a daily basis that we're trying to you know get things from and we're asking and we're it, it could be as simple as would you like to go out to eat we're hoping for people's love there's so much that we want. And yet, we believe that all of that is in the hands of Allah. We believe that all of that is in the hands of Allah. The sisters may need some more chairs, but there are some chairs here. So, we believe that all of that is in the hands of Allah. And so, you have a lot to talk about. Every single one of us has a lot to talk about when we go into Salah. We have a lot to, to, to ask for. And so, you know, maybe we'll get to this later, but we talked about it a little bit last week too. The Prophet ﷺ says, if you ask anyone, ask Allah. And if you're going to seek the help of anyone, then seek the help of Allah. And here, he says when you're in privately discoursing with him, in the same way that he comes close to the one who rubs his face in the dust when prostrating. And this rubbing the face in the dust when prostrating, it's an example of humility, brokenness. You know, Ibn Taymiyyah, Shaykh al-Islam is considered one of the geniuses that Islam has, has produced, great scholar. He, when he did not understand an issue, and he's a, he's a scholar par excellence as far as Islam goes, mastered so many different sciences, wrote so many books that, you know, could be considered PhDs, right? Um, and yet, when something, and he was brilliant, he, it was said that he never saw, his own eyes never saw anybody like him. You know, he was just that unique. Nonetheless, when there would be something that he wouldn't understand, he would go out into the in, outside of the city. He would go outside of the city, and he would rub his face in the dirt. He would rub his face in the dirt in sujood, and he would rub his face in the dirt, and he would say, "Ya Mufahim Sulaiman, Fahimni." Oh, the one who made Sulaiman understand, referring to an issue in the Quran where Sulaiman was given understanding that his father wasn't. He said, oh, understand, oh, oh a giver of Sulaiman understanding, make me understand. And so here he's realizing that this is spiritual access. This ilm, this knowledge, this understanding, this is something that Allah Azawajal is going to give you. It is something that Allah grants. Uh, it's a light that Allah Azawajal casts in the hearts of, of people. And so he would go and he would show this, this, that he was in a state of humility and humbleness to Allah Azza wa Jal so that he would be given knowledge. And so this is also something important to understand. You know, we're all sitting here in gatherings of knowledge and we all, all want to benefit. Imam Malik, he says, knowledge is not by a lot of narration. I know this hadith, I can quote you this ayah, I know this, I know that. But rather, he says, it is a light that Allah casts into the hearts of his believing servants. 
at some point it's tawfiq from Allah. It's Allah Azza who allows you to see. It's a, it's a, it's not just sight, but it's also insight. And so you have all of these narrations. Imam Shafi'i, in his famous verse of poetry, famous verse of poetry. You know, Imam Shafi'i had photographic memory. He had photographic memory, and it was said that he would have to, you know, when he was reading, when he would just be reading, he would have to cover one page because his mind would already start scanning the other page and he would start memorizing that other page even before he got to it, right? So he'd have to cover one page before he, so he could read in order. And then he said, uh, at one point in time, he was walking down the street and he saw the uh, woman and the story says that he, the wind began to blow and a part of her leg became uncovered. And that just, he saw that image. And the next thing he knows, his photographic memory is weakened. He's, he's, he's not able to memorize as soon as, as much as he used to. You know, Imam Ashab had memorized the Quran before he was 10 years old, and he had memorized the Muwatta, it's a very large collection of a hadith by Imam Malik before he ever met him, just in a couple of nights he memorized it. So he was used to just having this really, really strong memory, and then he goes to his teacher, Waqi ibn Jarrah, and Waqi, he's complaining to his teacher, he's like, my memory is gone, like it's not working like it used to. And so he says, شَكَوْتُ إِلَىٰ وَكِيعَ سُؤَحِفْضِ فَأَرْشَدَنِي إِلَىٰ تَرْكَ الْمَعَاصِ وَخَبَرِنِي بِأَنَّ الْعِلْمَ نُورُ وَنُورُ اللَّهِ لَا يُؤْتَى لِعَاصِ The famous verse that he says, the couplet, he says, I complained to Waki, my teacher, about how bad my memory was, and he guided me to leaving sin. And he told me that this knowledge is a light from Allah, and the light is, no, he says, this knowledge is light, and the light of Allah is not given to a sinner. Right? And so there's this spiritual aspect where we recognize that it's not just a matter of hitting the books hard and repetition and memorization and all of that. It is insight and it is illumination or it is a light that comes to you from Allah Azza wa And so here you have this state of brokenness that a person does. A person humbles themselves to Allah and they understand that Allah Azza wa is al alim or that Allah Azza wa is Al-Kareem and Allah Azza wa is Al-Razzaq. It's not just a matter of hustling really hard for the things that you want. That's part of it. Half of tawakkul is what you do, which is, you know, you hustling and making sure that you're doing everything that you need to do to actualize what it is that you want. But the other half is where your heart is. And your heart always has to be recognizing that Allah Azza is the facilitator, Allah is the provider, Allah is the bestower. And if He says no, then it doesn't matter who says yes. Okay. That he comes close to one who rubs his face in the dust when prostrating, in the same way that he draws near to the throngs of people visiting his house, standing in abject humility at Arafah. Arafah is the great day in which there are no, there's no day in which Allah frees more people from the hellfire than on the day of Arafah. And Allah Azza wa Jal boasts to the angels and he says, Allah comes near to the Hujjaj and he boasts to the angels and he says, Look at my servants, they have come dusty and disheveled. Right? And so they're in this state of brokenness. There's nobody proud on the day of Arawah. There's nobody you know, who's, who thinks highly of themselves. Everybody comes humbled on the day of Arafah. Everybody looks like you. Everybody is, has a journey similar to yours, if not a greater journey than yours. And so people on the day of Arafah are very humbled, and that is something that is beloved to Allah. And then he says here, he comes close to his servants when they invoke him, ask of him, and seek his forgiveness in the early hours of the morning, and he answers their supplications and grants their requests. You know there's a hadith. You know, uh, hadith can be divided into two categories. There's what's called mutawatir, and the second is called ahad. Ahad means a single narration, and mutawatir, M-U-T, mutawatir, M-U-T-A-W-A-T-T-I-R. Mutawatir means that it is narrated by so many people at every level in the chain of narration that it is impossible that they all are lying. So for example, is there anyone here that does not believe that a place called Australia exists? Is there anybody here who does not believe in Australia? Okay. Who here has been to Australia? Two people. Everybody else, though, we have 100% agreement that Australia exists, although 98% of the people here have never been to Australia. My question is, how are you guys all so sure that a place called Australia exists? For the ones who have never been there, how are you guys all so sure? What's that? 
majority believes that Australia is... Well, okay, so why do you believe if the majority believes? Why do you believe? If the majority believed in the tooth fairy, would you guys believe in it? You see it on the map. You see it. Okay, so you see it on the map. What else? Live in. Tell me what, what. Tell me what you guys have heard about Australia. Okay, there are kangaroos there. What else have you guys heard? What's that? Giant spiders? I've never heard that, but sure. They have accents. They have accents. What else do you guys? Come on, guys. Don't drag this out. This example. I want it to be quick and painless. They put shrimp on the Barbie. Okay, shrimp on the Barbie. Okay, great. What else? Dingoes. Huh? Dingoes. Dingoes. Great. So you guys are basically saying that the narrations that have come to you about Australia have reached this level of tawatu. What did we say tawatu is? So many people have narrated it to you that it is impossible that they all be lying. It is impossible that your entire life you have declared this to be impossible in your mind that everybody who's come and told you that there's a place called Australia and it's all the way on the other side of the world and they have kangaroos and they have koalas and they have shrimp on the barbies and they have accents and the information that's coming to you is consistent and so now it's reached a level of certainty in your mind even though you've never been there this is called tawatu it's the highest most authentic level of hadith where you're basically saying so many people have narrated this hadith one generation to the next that it is impossible that it all be a lie okay now I'm telling you this because the hadith that I'm going to mention to you is mutawatir. And that is that the Prophet ﷺ, he said that Allah Azza wa descends in a manner that befits His Majesty at the last third of every single night and He asks, who, am, who is asking forgiveness of me that I may forgive them? Who is repenting to me that I may accept their repentance? And who is asking me that I may grant them? These three things. Allah descends in the last third of every single night asking these three things. Over 40, 40 companions narrated this hadith. 40 companions. That's a lot. 40 companions. That's definitely tawatu. And every chain, every, le every generation after them was mutawatu. So... Over 40 companions narrate this statement means that Rasulullah must have mentioned this statement many, many times in many different gatherings. That's how 40 of them all heard it and they all narrated it from the Prophet Now if the Prophet is telling us this over, you know, to 40 different companions for them to narrate it, what is the point? What is he telling us? What does he want from us with this information? He wants us to believe it. He wants us to believe it and then? Act on, act on it how? Waking up. Right. You know, they, they talk about the magic hour. This is the hour. In the last third of every single night, how do you divide the, the third? You look at Maghrib time. What time is Maghrib? 5.30, 5.20 something. And then you look at what time Fajr is. And then you divide that into thirds. And that will give you the last third of the night. And so every single night, every single night, Allah Azza wa descends in the last third of every single night and he asks these three questions. Who's asking forgiveness for me right now? Allah Azza wa says in the Quran, They are seeking forgiveness from Allah. They would sleep little. Allah Azza wa is praising those who sleep little of the night and they seek his forgiveness in the Sahar time. The Sahar time is the pre-dawn time. Allah Azza wa is every single night asking for these three things. Who's seeking my forgiveness right now that I may forgive them? Who is repenting to me that I may accept their repentance? And who's asking me that I may grant them? And so the scholars, they said that whoever says that they want something, and how many of us say that we want stuff every single day and know people who want stuff? The scholars said, if a person says that they want something, and they can't find it in themselves to wake up for tahajjud, to ask for it, it must mean that they don't really want it. Because that's the hour. And so here, Ibn Rajab is pointing to this time, saying this is a time for you, a person with a broken spirit, a broken heart, humbly, the darkness, there's nobody there, 
that you converse with your Lord at that point in time. And one of the things for us to ask for in that moment of sahar is to ask Allah for khushur, to ask Allah the sweetness of the prayer, to ask Allah as I did to make us of those who love reciting the Quran. And that is one of the supplications that the Prophet ﷺ taught us to make. O oh Allah, make the Qur'an the spring of our hearts and the light of our chests and the remover of our sadness and the repeller of our stress. Right? Because if a person, up until this point right now, right, we're attending this class. If a person is every day going into the prayer and I'm not enjoying it, I'm not enjoying reciting the Qur'an, I'm in a good position. Why am I in a good position? Because I'm thinking about this. There are so many people who have just turned off even the, 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 the trial of it. They're not even trying to better their relationship. It's going to take time. It's not easy. These hearts are very rusty. We're going to spend some time polishing them and, and making, them, making them healthy again. But we at least have to really pay attention to the goal and then enjoy the process, enjoy the journey. You know, some of the scholars, they said that uh, one of them... I remember hearing him uh, say that I, str I struggled with Qiyamul Layl, praying the night for 20 years. And then I enjoyed it for another 20 years. I tasted its sweetness. So over 20 years, I'm praying Surah Az after Isha and trying to pray for and one night on and one night off and struggling really hard. I'm struggling with it. It's not easy. But then after he passed that and he broke through that barrier and that obstacle, he enjoyed the sweetness of, of Qiyamul Layl for 20 years. Right? So... It's going to take time, but let us continue. Go ahead, Sister. Yeah. There is nothing that tends to the brokenness of the servant more than closeness and response. Imam Ahmed, may Allah have mercy on him, records in his book Al Zuhud with his Isna to Imran ibn al Qusair, who said, Musa ibn Imran, Imran said, may, My Lord, where should I seek you? He replied, Seek me with those hearts, with those whose hearts have broken for my sake. Every day I come close to them by one arm span, and were it not for this, they would surely perish. Ibrahim ibn al Junaid, may Allah have mercy on him, records in his book, Al Mahabba, yep. With his isnad to Jaf. Jafar bin Ibn Suleiman, who said, I heard Malik Ibn Dinar saying, Musa salam, asked my God, where should I seek you? <coughs> Allah mighty and magnificent revealed to him, Musa, seek me with those whose hearts have broken for my sake, for I draw closer to them by an arm span every day, and were it not for this, they would surely perish. I asked Malik Ibn Dinar, what does broken hearts mean? He replied, I asked this question to one who rehearsed the scriptures, and he said that he had asked the same question to Abdullah ibn al-Salam, who replied, Broken hearts refers to those that have broken for the love of Allah, mighty and magnificent, rather than the love of anything else. The authentic sunnah proves that Allah is close to the heart that is broken by his tribulation, patient at his decree, and content. Muslim records on the authority of Abu Huraira that the Prophet Wasallam said, Allah might and magnificent will say on the day of the rising, O son of Adam Wasallam, I was ill yet you did not visit me. He will say, My Lord, how could I visit you while you are the Lord of the world? He will reply, Did you not know that such and such a servant of mine was ill yet you did not visit him? Did you not know what were you to have visited him? You would have found me with him. Abu Nuaym records via the route of Damra that Ibn Shildab said, Allah Most High revealed to Musa salam, Do you know why from all people I chose you for my message and speech? He replied, No, my Lord. He replied, Because none was as modest and humble before me as you were. Okay, great. Jazakallah khair. So, I don't want to just pass over these narrations because it's not a matter of quantity, it's a matter of quality. Our interaction with these narrations has to be at, a, at, at more depth because that's where change happens. And every single one of us here, we should have the intention, if we haven't made the intention yet, that we want to hear the speech and follow the best in it. Right? I want to, I want to change tonight. I want to learn one hadith, even if it's just one, or I want to learn one statement and I want that to, to ch I want to change. I want to come out a better person, a better uh, have a stronger relationship with Allah. I'm going to act on something here because 
it's not just information. You know, what made the Sahaba so unique as a generation was that their approach to the Qur'an and the Sunnah of the Prophet ﷺ was completely different than every generation that came after. Uh, the generations that came after, they learned to teach. So I'm learning so I can go teach. I'm learning so that I can debate somebody. I'm learning so that I can be inspired, motivated. I'm learning so that I could do this or do that. So people, you know, approach for different reasons after the companions. The companions, however, their approach to the Quran, to the Sunnah, was like a soldier approaches a bulletin board. What does my Lord want me to do? And I'm going to go do it right now. What does my Lord not want me to do? And I'm going to stop doing it right now. As best as they could. And so that's why it actually took them a very long time, many of them, to memorize the Quran. For us, we sit down and we'll memorize a page, two pages in a day, half a page, whatever, we'll knock it out. And then you hear something like Umar ibn Khattab taking 10 years to memorize Surah Al-Baqarah. It's not because Umar who was a slow reader or a slow memorizer or something like that. But it was, their approach was that they would not go past 10 verses until they understood what the instructions of those 10 verses and implemented those 10 verses in their life before they would go on to the next. And so as you can imagine, you can see how their reaction and their experience to the Quran Ibn Abbas, he says, when you hear, Ya ayu al amanu, lend it your ear. Why? Because either a command is coming, and you, once you hear, Ya ayu al amanu, O you who believe, there's either a command coming in that verse for you to do, or there's a prohibition for you to stay away from. And so, when we're reading these statements, let's, you know, immediately remember that the first person the Quran is addressing and the Sunnah is ever addressing is always you. It's always you. So look at it and Project it on yourself. So here, for example, you have this hadith where the Prophet Abu Huraira says that Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa says, Allah will say on the day of rising, O son of Adam, I was sick and you didn't visit me. And then any one of us will say, Ya Rabb, how could I visit you? You're the Lord of, you're God. You're the Lord of the worlds. And then Allah Azza will point to somebody in your social circle, somebody in your family, and he will say, didn't you know that so-and-so was sick? And if you had went and visited them, you would have found me there. You would have found me with them. And so this is a reminder now, just immediately, implementable. Go and visit the sick. Don't, don't uh, turn away from it. You know, I, one of my teachers, the, one of the busiest men that I know, super busy. So much so, I get bothered when people come to ask him for stuff because I know that he is... So, so, so busy. And then one day after Maghrib, uh, we're at the masjid, we pray Maghrib, and some guy says, uh, hey, Shaykh, I'm going to go visit so-and-so. Somebody that I know he doesn't know. He has no idea who this person is. Do you want to come? He says, let's go. <laughs> I'm like, man, I don't even have the time to go visit. I know you guys. But I went with him because the Shaykh is going. And we went. And we sat for 20 minutes and we visited this person and then we left. But that's this hadith. And here... If this is authentic, Musa being asked by Allah Azza wa Jalla, he's, he's asking Allah, where am I going to find you? And he says, find me with the broken. You know, th uh, there's a statement that I heard once uh, that says that there are more sincere prayers said in hospitals than in churches. Right? And I found that to be very profound and add masajid to that. There are more sincere prayers said in hospitals than masajid and churches and anywhere else. And so if you want to be in that type of uh, of a place and a space, go to where the sick are. Go and sit with them. The Prophet ﷺ, he says that when a person stands at the head of a person, they are surrounded by mercy. And then when they sit down, they're enveloped in it. They're immersed in mercy. In that moment where you're standing with the sick person, and you don't have to stay for a long time with the sick. The Prophet ﷺ, as soon as that you sit for a very short time with the sick, but you give them some good news, you give them some bushra, you give them some some hope, and then you leave, and that's it, right? But it is important. The, the other beautiful thing here is this notion that we've been talking about in Kisa, being humbling yourself. I know sometimes, even for me, I'm reading this broken, broken, like what does that even mean? But just humbling yourself in the presence of Allah. And I remember hearing uh, Shaykh Salih al maghamsi he's the Imam of Majid Quba, and he's one of the most spiritual people I've ever seen. Like on YouTube, 
He's amazing. This man cannot give a lecture without breaking down and crying out of the awe and reverence of Allah. You get so jealous just watching him. It's like, what type of relationship do you have with Allah? He recites a verse of the Quran and it's just tears. And everybody's just watching him like, what do you... But anyway, he was talking about being humble in the presence of, of, of Allah. And he said the first place and the greatest place for a person to humble themselves is when they walk into the houses of Allah. So when you walk into the message, when you're in a place like this, you recognize that you're not in your house and you're not entering into the house of the weak or that you are entering into the house of Allah. And so that is the first place where you humble yourself. You don't raise your voice. You don't have any of that arrogance. Don't bring any of that with you into the message. And realize that you don't know. You may be arrogant to somebody and that person is closer to Allah much better to Allah or much better with Allah than you are no matter who you are and then he gave an example he said Allah Azza wa forgave a prostitute from Bani Israel you guys know the story because she gave water to a dog Allah forgave her sins now did Bani Israel know that her status had changed with Allah no in fact they would still have judged her next day day after as a prostitute. She was a prostitute two days ago. She was a prostitute for however long. She's walking amongst the people and they're judging her. They're looking at her and, and they can only judge by the outward. Nobody knows the inward, right? But they see a prostitute and she's walking amongst them having been completely forgiven by Allah. In that moment, she's in a status way better than anybody else there. But you don't know. And so the whole point is you should not be arrogant towards anybody, no matter what your status is and no matter what their status is, because you don't know who's walking out, uh, in a, into a room sinless. And you don't know who's walking into a room having done something that Allah Azza wa appreciated and written for them to be of the people of paradise. Okay? The first thing to be lost is Khushu. This modesty and humility of his was none other than Khushu, and that is beneficial knowledge, and that is the first thing to be raised with knowledge. Nasai records the hadith of Jubair ibn Nufair on the authority of Awf bin Malik, ibn Malik that one day the Messenger of Allah وسلم, looked at the sky and said, This is the vessel to which knowledge will be raised. A man from the Ansar called Ziyad ibn Labib said, Messenger of Allah, how is it that knowledge will be raised and now that it has now that it has become firm and the hearts have preserved it? He replied, I thought that you were the most intelligent of Medina's people. He then went on to mention the misguidance of the Jews and Christians, despite their having the Book of Allah, mighty and magnificent. Jabir said, So I met Shadab ibn Aus and narrated this hadith to him, and he said, Oh has spoken truthfully. Did I not tell you the first part of knowledge to be raised? I replied, of course. He said, push you until the time will come that you will not see a single person having it. A similar hadith is also recorded by Thirmidhi via Jubair ibn Nufair on the authority of Abu al-Darda from the Prophet ﷺ. The end of this hadith has Jubair said, so I met Ubada ibn al samit and I said to him, Will you not hear something from me that I heard from your brother, Abu al-Darda? I narrated to him what Abu al-Darda had narrated to me. He said, Abu al-Darda has spoken truthfully. If you wish, I will narrate to you about the first knowledge to be raised from the people, Khushu. Soon will come a time when you will enter a large masjid and not see a single person having it. It is said that the version of Nusai is the stronger version. Sayyid ibn Bash Bashir narrated on the authority of Qatada, on the authority of Al-Hassan, may Allah have mercy on him, on the authority of Shadad ibn Aws that the Prophet ﷺ said, the first knowledge to be raised from the people will be Khushu. This was also recorded by Abu Bakr ibn Abu Maryam on the authority of Zamra ibn Habib as a Mursal Hadith. A similar statement is also reported as the words of Hudayfa. So here you go. The first knowledge to be revealed or to, to be um, raised from the people is khushu' in the prayer. That's the first thing to God. And so you might come into a masjid 
and it'd be packed and nobody, not a single person half for sure, not a single person care. And I've seen this so many times, so many times. You have masajid where people will fight the <coughs> imam if the imam recites a surah other than the select few surahs of Juz Amma. Why is that? Is it because they love the surah of Juz Amma? They love Qul Allahu Ahad because it's a third of the Quran, that's their attachment to the surah? No, it's because I want this salat to be done with. It's five minutes or less, or that's it. And so if the imam recites a longer passage of the Qur'an or a different surah or changes it up, people get upset. Well, why are they getting upset? Because there's no for sure. That's what it is. There's no for sure. There's no interacting with the words of Allah. There's no, this is the, this is the, this is, uh, the words of God that are being addressed to me. Because if that was the case, then you'd want to hear the entire Qur'an. You'd want to learn everything. You'd want to be guided. I want to be able to navigate through my life. And um, I want to be able to talk to Allah. And so I don't mind if the Imam goes into sujood for two or three minutes, however long, because I've got so much to say myself. I want to get lost in the prayer. You know, I, was, um, I went to Texas a and and I was told they have this 100,000 person stadium, okay? And if you are, at, uh, when you go to the football games, are you anybody here from Texas A&M? Okay, do you have the ring? No. Okay, okay. <laughs> so, when you go to the football game, you can correct me if I'm wrong, but this is what I was told, that when you go to the football games, all of the actual undergrads have to stand the entire length of the football game. Is that correct? So football game is how many hours? Two or three hours? And they have to stand. They have to stand. And if they sit down, so the parents and all those guys, they can sit down for the game. But the, the undergrad, they have to stand during the entire length of the football game. And if they sit down, then one of the older you know, classmates can tell them, stow. <laughs> they have to they, they get up and tell them, get up. Right? And this is enjoyable. Like people are there and they're fine with it because they're so engaged in the game and the experience and all of that. I'm thinking to myself, if the Imam goes five minutes longer in Taraweeh, ten minutes longer in Taraweeh, everybody's upset. Everybody's upset. Or in any Salah, everybody's upset. Why? Because there's no engaging. There's no engagement in the actual Salah. Right? And so, it is, this isn't far-fetched what they're talking about. They're making him a time when the entire masjid nobody will have for sure. That's what they're talking about. Right? Or something even more. Allah. So, one of the advices that some of the people give about um, the imams is that should, they should, I know I studied Malik and Fiqh and the imams, they said that people should only recite from a certain, like the, you know, the last three sections of the Quran, so mm -hmm. you don't hold people long. And in your own personal, uh, when you do your own personal prayer, you can do as long as you want, but you have to keep that in mind that when you're, you know, you're an imam, you have to keep it at a certain Certain Absolutely, but again, that does not mean that the, the Imam should never recite from, from the Quran. I mean, that's what, what do we do? We tell people, oh, we need a, we need a hafiz for, to be the Imam of our masjid. We need a hafiz. We need a hafiz. Why do you need a hafiz if all you need is the last half of Juz Amma? You don't need a hafiz for that, right? You just need anybody. Other, and so the whole point is the time. Yes, the person should be cognizant of people's time. And the famous story of that is Mu'ad ibn Jabal. Mu'ad ibn Jabal is a great companion of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. He is a scholar from amongst the Sahaba. In fact, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said he's the most knowledgeable of this ummah regarding halal and haram. And he said that on the day of judgment, the ulama will be resurrected and Mu'ad will be ahead of the ulama of this ummah by a footstep. He's ahead of everybody, radiallahu anhu. Mu'ad would go and pray Isha with Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And then he would go back to his community and he would lead them in Isha. And Mu'adh would lead with Surah Al-Baqarah and it was so long that at some point one of the people in the prayer stepped out of the prayer and prayed their own prayer and left. Okay? And so the people, you know, they criticize this guy and they're like, he's a, he's a munafiq, he's, you know, he's a, he's a hypocrite, he can't hang. And so the man went and told Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa and the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa was incredibly upset and he summoned Mu'adh and he said, Afatanun anta ya Mu'adh, Afatanun anta ya Mu'adh, he says, are you a, a causer of fitna ya Mu'adh? 
you're, 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 you're bringing trials to the people, you're testing the people, you're bringing these, them these problems. And then he said, whoever of you leads, then let him lighten the prayer. But lightening the prayer, by the way, again, does not mean, قُلُوا Allah and قُلُوا عَذَّ رَبِّ فَاقِ You know, the Sahaba, they used to read these long surahs. Here's the point being, is coming back to enjoying the prayer. If a person enjoys the prayer, inshallah ta'ala, hopefully, we want to get to this point where we're lost. Where we actually, one day, we just say, oh, let the imam go longer. That one day, if the imam goes into overtime, we get as excited about overtime in the salah as we do when the game goes into overtime. You know? We want to get to that point. Okay, let's read uh, Beneficial Knowledge, inshallah ta'ala, and then wrap up. Even though Beneficial Knowledge looks like it's a long chapter. Okay, do you mind if I just read this chapter? Yes. Beneficial Knowledge. Beneficial knowledge is that which impresses itself on the heart, leading to its quietude and humility. It's being meek and shy before Allah and it's breaking for His sake. If knowledge doesn't impress upon the heart in this way and instead is merely something spoken on the tongue, it becomes the proof of Allah against the son of Adam, which will be established against him and others. Ibn Mas'ud said there are people who recite the Qur'an, yet it doesn't descend beyond their throats. Were it to reach the heart and take roots therein, it is then that it would benefit. So here, knowledge is of two types. Knowledge of the heart and knowledge of the tongue. Knowledge of the tongue is that which you're able to quote. Allah says this and that and this and that. And the Prophet says this and that. Knowledge of the tongue does not benefit. In fact, it is evidence, evidence against the person on the Day of Judgment because you knew. And in fact, you could quote. And in fact, you read. What benefits? Knowledge of the heart. That which takes roots in the heart and is affirmed by action. That which you do. Question here. Does that mean that I should stop gaining knowledge because I don't want to get too much evidence against me? Somebody might say, well, it's been a nice class. I'm not coming anymore. <laughs> right? There are people who might take that type of a position. Ignorance is bliss. What, what is your response to that? Check yourself before you wreck yourself. Okay, thank you, Ice Cube. <laughs> <laughs> okay, other than uh, lyrics from 1992. <laughs> what would you respond? I'm asking you. Somebody says this to you. They're like, no, I don't want to come to anything. I don't want to read anything. I don't want to read Quran or every verse is an evidence. It's once I know, I got to do it. So it's better not to know. doesn't implement they should still come okay because they're them being in that you know environment you don't know when Allah gives them guidance very good right so the knowledge itself will guide you eventually right just like we talked about the salah the salah will guide you the knowledge itself will guide you and that's a wrong that's a wrong um, perspective to take which is I don't want to change, and so I'm just not going to learn. You know what the goodness is, and instead, we have to ask Allah to guide our hearts towards the goodness and strive to become better. Because there's two things that are important here. One is that you have to recognize that your real happiness, you know the happiness that we all strive for and want, the Muslim and the non-Muslim and everybody, that's really in following the guidance that Allah sent doesn't matter how many self-help books you read. doesn't matter, you know, all of that that you do. In the, in the end, it is with Allah Azza wa Jalla. There's a beautiful hadith. I quote it so many times. The Prophet Sallallahu he says, إِنَّ رُوحَ الْقُدُسِ نَفَثَ فِي رُوعِي أَنَّهُ لَن تَمُوتَ نَفْسٌ حَتَّى تَسْتَكْمِلَ رِزْقَهَا وَأَجَلَهَا The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi says, The Holy Spirit cast into my essence that no soul will pass away until it completes both its risk and its lifespan. And so the Prophet وسلم, then says, Meaning, both of those things are going to come to you 100%. You're going to get everything you're provided of wealth and happiness. This is, is not just money. It's happiness and health and blessings and all of that. You're going to get all of that that's written for you. And you're going to get your lifespan. You're going to get every last day, every last hour, every last minute. So then what is his advice? His advice is, So then fear Allah and seek out those things beautifully. Seek out that risk beautifully. Seek out uh, your life beautifully. And then he says, وَلَا يَحْمِلَنَّكُمْ اسْتِبْتَاءَ الْرِزْقِ 
he says, and do not let the delay of that rizq make you seek it out in a way that Allah has prohibited. We desire happiness, we desire love, we desire companionship. And Allah as we just says, or the Prophet ﷺ commands for us to get married and not have any relationships outside. But it's delayed. And I'm in college, I'm in high school, and to me that's like a huge delay. I'm 68, I'm 17, I'm 21, I'm 31, I'm whatever. Don't let that delay make you seek it out in a way that Allah Azawajal has prohibited. Why? Because the Prophet وسلم, says, What is with Allah is not secured, is not acquired, except by His obedience. The reason why we get risk getting money is because of what it facilitates so, of, of resources, right? And the reason why we, we seek companionship is because of, of, of the... Of, the comfort and the and the companionship itself. But the Prophet ﷺ says, those things that you are wanting, they're not acquired except through Allah's obedience. You're not going to get it. A person may get this through a couple of quick transactions, haram business, whatever, but then they don't see any of the barakah that they wanted in that wealth. A person is seeking love and all they get is heartbreak and being used and abused and, and, and sadness at the end of all of it. So the Prophet ﷺ says, all of this that you want is all in the hands of Allah, so seek it with Allah. Okay? And so that's number one. As for number two, I completely forgot, because now we're done. Okay, so beneficial knowledge. Uh, says Ibn Mas'ud says, there are people who recite the Qur'an, yet it doesn't descend beyond their throats. Were it to reach the heart and take root therein, it is then that it would benefit. Al Hassan said, knowledge is two types. Knowledge that is superficial utterance upon the tongue, that is Allah's proof against the children of Adam. When we said Al Hassan, who is Al Hassan? Al Basri, good. That is Allah's proof against the children of Adam, and knowledge that takes root in the heart, that is beneficial knowledge. This is also reported by Al Hassan. May Allah have mercy on him from the Prophet ﷺ, as a Mursal hadith. He also reports it uh, from Jabir anhu and Anas anhu to the Prophet وسلم, but it is not authentic as a hadith of his وسلم. anyway so he, he's saying it's also reported by Hassan but that it's not authentic hence the Prophet وسلم, informed Adas that despite the knowledge that the people of book were given being readily available to them they did not benefit from it, any of it since the primary goal beyond this knowledge was missing it's reaching their hearts such that they could experience the sweetness of faith and realize its benefit of achieving fear and penitence. Now, just stop right here. So, the time of the Prophet ﷺ, the Prophet is saying, even though the people of the book had their books, they weren't benefiting from it. It wasn't reaching their hearts. They were carriers of it. And now, we have more information, access to more information than any generation of the Muslim Ummah ever. You want hadith, Google search. You want tafsir, Google search. You'll have on your iPad or on your iPhone thousands of books. It's not due to a lack of information. We have all of the books. We have the Quran, Tajweed coded with all of the tafsir and all of that good stuff on it. But we're not interacting with it. We're not interacting with it. We're not sitting there and, and, and you know, just take one thing. You don't have to take everything from every single class and from every single lecture that you hear, you don't have to take everything, but just take one thing and then immediately act upon it. And that's why, you know, Abdullah ibn Mas'ud, he has this beautiful statement that I love. He's talking about the companions, and, you know, what made them so different? And he says, whoever of you seeking a path and follow the path of those who have passed away, Muhammad, they are Muhammad, he says, because you don't know those who are living what's going to happen to them, the trials that happen in their lives. You don't know how they're going to end. So follow the path of those who have passed away. Those who have passed away and they passed away on goodness, those are the ones who, to follow. He's talking about the companions. And then he says, they were the best of this ummah. They had the most righteous hearts. They were the least superficial and they had the deepest knowledge. The companions were not about frivolity and superficialness. They, 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 they could care less about that. But he also says they had the deepest knowledge. And what that means is that he didn't say they have the most knowledge. He said they have the deepest. Abdullah ibn Mas'ud himself is a great scholar from the Sahaba, one of the most learned about the Qur'an. He said they had the deepest knowledge. And what that meant was that a single hadith that a companion learned penetrated their heart in a way that did not penetrate any other generation that came after. They immediately acted upon a hadith or an ayah 
in a way that nobody else did. It transformed them in a way that it didn't transform anybody else. You have someone like Imam Ahmed, great scholar of Islam, <coughs> one of the greatest of all time. He had memorized a thousand, thousand hadith, one million hadith. I don't think there's any companion who had a million statements of Rasulullah memorized. Even though hadith are not a million statements, it is all of the chains of narration that's also considered a hadith. But the point being is that they had memorized so much the generation that came after people like Imam al-Bukhari and Imam Ahmed. And not only that, they didn't just know the fiqh of one companion, but they mixed between the fiqh of many companions. They would know the fiqh and the fatawa of this companion and this companion and this companion. So they, as far as information, they had more. But Ibn Mas'ud didn't say they had the most knowledge. And maybe one of us, you know, we you know, memorize some books and memorize all of this and we might know more than many companions. But they had the deepest. And I give you an example, short example. And we'll end with this. And we'll end here. Which is the end of page 30. Ali ibn Abi Talib, he tells a story. When he was young and married to Fatima radiallahu anha, Fatima used to grind barley. She used to grind barley. And Ali used to carry water. That was his job. He used to go and he used to carry water for somebody. And so he would carry the water until his back hurt. He started to have back pain from that. And Fatima radiallahu anha used to grind barley until her hands radiallahu anha became calloused. And so one day they're talking to each other and Adi's complaining about his back and she's complaining about her hands. And he says to her, Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa has secured some servants. So why don't you go and ask him for a servant? And so Fatima radiallahu goes to ask him for a servant. We all know how much Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa loves Fatima. When she would come into a gathering, he would always get up and he would sit here where he was seating and he would... She was the one who resembled him the most from his children and all of that. So she comes to ask her, you know, she's his princess and he's daddy. So she's coming to ask daddy for a servant. And so the Prophet ﷺ, he says to her, No, by Allah, I'm not going to give you and leave Ahlul Sufa. Now who's Ahlul Sufa? Ahlul Sufa are the people who live in the masjid. It's like the people who are on welfare in the state of Medina. And so the Prophet is saying to her, I'm not going to give you a privilege that I cannot afford to give to every last citizen of Medina, even Ahlul Sufa. If I'm not going to be able to give them a servant, I'm not going to give you a servant, even though she's his daughter. Story continues that night, Ali radiallahu anha, Ali radiallahu anhu says that uh, after him and his wife had laid down to sleep that night, the Prophet asked permission to enter at the door. And he comes. And he stands in between them. Ali radiallahu anhu says, I felt the coolness of his feet on my skin. And so the Prophet sallallahu then said to them, Shall I not tell you what's better for you than a servant? Yes, Ya Rasulullah. He said, every night that when you go to sleep, you say subhanAllah 33 times, alhamdulillah 33 times, and Allah Akbar 33 times. That is better for you than a servant. The ulama, they commented on this, and they extracted on this, and they said, Dhikrullah, that the remembrance of Allah strengthens the body. It gives you actual strength. So here the Prophet ﷺ is directing them to something that will help them in their day-to-day -day chores, in their work, in their manual labor, the remembrance of Allah. Ali ibn Abi Talib is telling this story decades later. He's Amir al -Mu'mini. He's Amir al -Mu'mini. And He's lived through battling Ma'awiyah and the Khawarij. This is near the end of his life. And he's telling this story about the Prophet ﷺ. And he then makes a comment. And he says, ever since the Prophet ﷺ told me this, I never once went to sleep, once went to sleep, without saying SubhanAllah 33 times, Allah Akbar 33 times, Allah and Alhamdulillah 33 times. Never, once, 30 years, who knows, every single night, because he learned one thing. I've told this story so many times, and I can't even tell you 
I can't even say any that I've come close anywhere to every single night before I go to sleep. I say Subhanallah thirty three times. They had the deepest knowledge. It wasn't the most knowledge. They had the deepest knowledge. There's always one person who likes to challenge the person who's teaching, right? So there's one person in that crowd who says to Ali ibn Abi Talib, he says, not even on the day of Safin? He says, not even on the day of Safin? You know what the day of Safin was? The day of Safin was the day when the army of Ali clashed with the army of Muawiyah. The day of Ali when the army of Muawiyah clashed with the army of Ali. And that day, more Muslims died on the day of Safin than in all of the battles from the day of Safi to the time of Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam combined. More people died on that one day, more Muslims died on that one day than all of the Muslim campaigns combined. You're talking about the expansions of Umar bin Khattab into the Persian Empire and the Roman Empire. You're talking about Uthman and the expansion of the Muslim Empire. You're talking about Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. You add all of those casualties and on the one day of Safi, more Muslims died than all of those combined. Ali ibn Abi Talib was seen walking amongst the dead. And he was screaming out to his son and he was saying, Hassan, I wish that I had died before this day by 20 years. I wish that I never saw this day. Everywhere he sees, he sees Muslims dead. Because both sides were Muslim, right? We say that the, the war in American history that had the most American casualties was what? Civil the Civil War. War, right? Both sides are American. And so that day, you can imagine the trauma and the stress and the anxiety of that day where you are going to ask Allah Azza wa Jal. You're going to be asked by Allah about the day of Safin. And Ali is responsible. Or Ali is a leader of that day. Him and Muawiyah. Even on the day of Safin, when he laid to bed that night, he says, SubhanAllah 33 times, Alhamdulillah 33 times, Allah 33 times. Right? That's the the way that they would interact with the text. That's the way that they would interact with what they heard from Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And so I hope that inspires all of us to really, really try to, to bite onto what we learn. It's not about how much you learn, but really it's about what you do with what you learn. May Allah Azza wa make us of those who hear the, hear the speech and follow the best of it. Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, Muhammad wa I think uh, we're gonna be going earlier now, every uh, week. Um, and so, if it's okay with you guys, we'll be starting right after Isha at 7.30. Does that work for everybody? Does it not work for anybody? Isha, okay. Isha is at 7.30, so... So, pray Isha. Yeah, yeah. It's okay. We're going to start after Isha, but you guys are more than welcome to come and actually pray Isha uh, as well. <laughs> Isha's at 7.30.